Welcome to EOZ TV. I'm Elder. I'm uh, Mrs. Elder. And today we are going to talk a little bit about If Not Now. This is the organization that um, is a very anti-Zionist organization. They are becoming famous because they do a lot of um, publicity stunts. And the latest stunts they've been doing, they started last summer, is they, um, they pretty much hijack birthright trips to Israel. Birth how Go ahead. No, I was going to say, how exciting. Yeah, yeah, right. Always Bur hijacking is really a great way to get some publicity. Of course, and then uh, their heroes happen to be hijackers, too, from the 70s. But that's another question. That's another Ooh, story. Yeah. Tell <laughs> no, me no, more. No, no, no. The, um, that, that's, um, that's a slight joke. But um, essentially, they, um, what they did in the summer, and they did also recently, is they'll send their own people on a free trip to Israel with birthright, but instead of enjoying and learning about Israel, they think they know all the answers and they try to interrupt and mess up the trip for everybody else. Stupid question. Are they actually using birthrights money? Of course. Oh, my God. So yeah. yes. birthright is paying for them to... Exactly. Ooh. Um, and then birthright added rules saying you don't interrupt the trip. And now the last time they showed up and they started interrupting and they said, all we did was ask questions. And it's complete garbage because I know from other birthrighters, you're allowed to ask questions. You can even ask very pointed questions. Nobody's going to kick you off the trip. These people were clearly pre-planning. They were members of If Not Now, of course. They were clearly pre-planning pre pre to um, mess things up. At any rate, the other thing they're doing, besides actually going on these trips, is they're trying to infiltrate people that are going to go on the trips. They're meeting them at the airport. They're finding out where the, where the planes are leaving, and they're giving literature to these uh, students who generally don't know much about Israel and trying to get them to ask questions that will be uncomfortable for the birth rate tour guides. Ooh. Yeah. So, uh, no, and they the, couldn't be doing something like right. that. Right. Now, you have to realize the tour guides <clears throat> are tour guides. They, uh, they actually are trained as tour guides. They're not trained as political analysts. Um, just because you know a lot about Israel doesn't necessarily mean you know how to answer questions from people who are opposed to Israel. Well, I was going to say, if they're planted inside, you know what I mean? It's like uh, the kind of questions they're going to ask are going to be specifically so they can't answer them, probably. They're going to try to make questions like that, exactly. So over here, we have a tweet from them where they said, from L.A. to Boston and New York City, we're sending birthright participants off on trips with info about the occupation and questions they can ask their tour guide. If you're going on a birthright trip, come and find us a check-in. So I tweeted back to them with an offer. I said, if you want to know the answer to your questions, ask me the questions, and I'll be happy to post the answers on my blog. This is assuming you actually want to learn the answers and aren't only trying to do publicity stunts. So send me the list. What Ooh, do you think they? they yeah. What do you think they did? Ignored. Of course. Um, they know that they they're that they're playing a game over here. They know they're not interested in actually getting. Any Why don't you have all out. your readers tweet to them to send you the questions? Don't need to, because I found out what the questions were either. Anyway, well, I found out what some of the questions are from going to their website. So now, during but they a, should do that anyway. Well, they could <laughs> if they want to. I mean, you should to. have your readers. Tweet them so that they can respond uh, to you. My readers know how to act. Um, <laughs> Just saying, let's put on the pressure. We can do it. They don't. Uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. There's other things we can do to birthright, but that's I mean, to, uh, to if not now. But that's in a, that's a separate issue. Hey, listen, got to go while we can. You know. Yeah, yeah. We're, okay. We're, we're, go ahead. I don't mean to keep interrupting. Anyway, the um, so here's the here are the questions that um, at least one sheet of paper. First, they quote Hillel, who they call Rabbi Hillel. Nobody calls it a Rabbi Hillel except for Gentiles and people who don't know anything about Judaism, just so you know. Um, <laughs> nobody nobody ever calls it Rabbi Hillel. It's very funny. But, um, th but that's where they got the name of the organization from, of course, if not now, when. But nevertheless, some questions to ask on your birthday trip. So here, we're going to go through a few of these over here ourselves because the, I can't answer the last couple because I'm not a birthright person. But the first four we can talk about. And it's very interesting because these are essentially loaded questions. Certainly the first two are loaded questions. And Well, the question is, I'm looking at it myself, and it says, what is the occupation? And to be quite honest, it gets me a little bubbling mad over this because there is no occupation, but hey. Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I was going to say is that... Uh, and Please, explain. Right, and it's, and it's funny because if you say there's no occupation, usually people just turn off immediately and don't want to listen to a word you say because, oh, you're a right-wing extremist. But, Ooh, I'm a right, 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 yeah, let's, my right, hand. Yeah, right yeah. yeah, so let's, um, but at any rate, let's at least answer the question of what is an occupation before we say the occupation, because when you say the word the occupation, you put it in capital O, occupation, like this is the only occupation in the world. Um, you make it sound like it's, ooh, this evil thing that's going on. And they, and they pretty much try to do that all the time. You know, they'll try to use language against Israel. But let's answer the question as honestly as we actually can. 
Ooh, First, you want to be honest and answer Yes, a I'm going to be honest and accurate in answering your question. Oh, I like that. Let's okay. go. <laughs> so the first question is, what is occupa- what does occupation mean in international law? Because it has a very precise meaning in international law. And when people are talking occupation, they're talking a legal definition. Okay, so I think you're going to share that with me now so that you can educate me, right? Sure. Okay, let's the, hear it. There is literally only one place in international law that's, 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 uh, that, that is used today that defines occupation. Okay, humor me. Tell me what it says. It is not the Geneva Conventions. Everybody thinks it's the Geneva Conventions. It's not written in the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions has laws of occupation, but it doesn't define occupation. Okay. The definition of occupation comes from the Hague 1907 Conventions. And I have it over here. Here's a, it's an Article 42, but over here, this is the laws of Slow war. Slow down. So Sorry. it's Article 42. Right, okay. In the, the Hague. The Hague 1907 Conventions, Laws of War, Hague Fourth Convention of the Hague, October 18th, 1907. So if you go laws down. Laws of War. The Laws of War. This is the only place it is actually defined what the word occupation means. Okay, good. So I want to see what article is it? 42. 42. <laughs> right. Okay. So it says... It's not that important. The article number is not that important. I'm just looking at, I'm <laughs> okay. looking at your screen. Okay. Territory is considered occupied when it is actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. That's number one. Number two, the occupation extends only to the territory where such authority has been established and can be exercised. Now, there's one other very interesting thing about the Hague Convention, as well as the Geneva Conventions, as well as every other international convention. I think you're going to share that. I am. Okay. If you go back up to Article... Two, okay. It says the present convention do not apply except between contracting powers, and then only if all the belligerents are parties to the convention. In other words, for something to be for a land to be occupied, it ha- the land itself has to belong to a country that signs these conventions. Okay, wait a minute. Say that one more time. Okay. <laughs> so in other words, you have a war going on, right? Okay. Generally, that's how lands become occupied: is in a war. There's an army ends up going into the other army, into the other country, okay? okay? So when the army goes into another country, they control part of that land, and the part that they control is called occupied. Okay. Until that first nation decides to annex it and say it's part of their own country or something like that, which is a separate, separate problematic thing nowadays in international law. But nevertheless, that's the only other way. So, But until that happens, as long as the army's in control of land, it is considered occupied from another army. The other army has to belong to a country that is a signatory that signed this convention. Okay. Okay? So if you go into Antarctica, you inv- let's say a country decides to invade Antarctica, and let's pretend that there are no conventions about Antarctica, and let's pretend it's just completely stateless, there would be, it wouldn't be occupied because there's no country called Antarctica. There's no country that is a signatory to these conventions that's called Antarctica. It's just empty. If you go into the moon, it wouldn't be occupied, right? But if it's against another country, there's occupation. It has to be between two nations, okay? okay. So that's the important thing. So what, what that means is that, and we're going to jump to that in a second, but what it means is... So you're going to relate it back to what the current situation is, Exactly, correct. right. Ooh. Okay, so... Uh, if, so, again, we're going to, again, jumping ahead, but we'll, we'll get to it in a second, but there was never a state called Palestine that would be considered occupied because they would have had to have been a state and one of the people that signed, one of the states that signed these conventions. Same thing would apply to Geneva Conventions or something like that. So by strict international law, the territories, and let's, we can go to... Uh, we can go to them right now. So here's the this classic picture of, of, of Israel okay. showing what people call the territories. Okay. So which would which also ends up answering their second question is where are the occupied territories? So we're gonna con- we're gonna answer these two things together. Um, what they consider the occupied territories is the is what they call the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Okay. The, these are territories that Israel conquered from another country in 1967. What was the name of that other country in 1967 that they got this month, that these, these uh, territories from? Tell me. It was, well, that, that, that makes things interesting. Jordan is who controlled the West Bank. Egypt is who controlled the Gaza Strip. Okay. Not Palestine. There was no country named Palestine. Yeah, it but was, they're always changing history so that they can make their arguments. What do you expect? Exactly. But nevertheless, the, so Jordan controlled the West Bank. Now, Jordan at, did annex the West Bank. 
1949 or 1950, what, what Jordan calls the West Bank, what Israel calls Judea and Samaria. But Jordan calls it the West Bank because it's the West Bank of the Jordan River. So Jordan did annex it, in, but practically no nations um, accepted that annexation. So okay. Practically, so either if you were one of the nations, I think Great Britain is really almost the only one that that uh, recognized it. So if you say that the West Bank was occupied Jordanian territory, that's one thing. Um, if you say that, um, you know, the same thing you could say the Gaza Strip is occupied Egyptian territory, just Egypt never really annexed the Gaza Strip. They always kept it as a separate thing. But either way, it is, well, certainly with the case of Gaza, it wasn't a country. And Egypt didn't take a claim over it. I mean, they, claimed, they, they controlled it, but they didn't really claim it as theirs. So therefore, it, there's no law of occupation, according to the Hague or the Geneva Conventions, because there wasn't a country on the other end of the war. That was that claimed to own Gaza. Okay. In Jordan's case, Jordan's annexation was widely described as being illegal, which means that Jordan didn't own the West Bank either, according okay. to most people. So, therefore, the lands that Israel managed to regain in 1967 mm -hmm. were, it is not under the rules of occupation because occupation rules are only between two nations that nations that signed the conventions, the Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions. Tell me anything that the Palestinians have ever done that had been honest. I'm sorry. Well, this is not even Disney before the Palestinians. No, but I'm saying from their... From their this is not even Palestinian. They hijacked the Palestinian name. Right, but that's a, but they we're not even there. I understand <laughs> that. I'm just saying to you, I'm just trying to make a point. Okay. Everything about what they do is never the truth. That's... <laughs> I don't like making generalizations like that. But, Fair enough. Okay, so, so from a strict specific application of what the word occupation means in a legal sense, okay, that's why these territories are not occupied. Okay, fair enough. Israel calls, it, Israel calls it disputed territories. Why does Israel think that they have a claim to the territories? Okay, to in order to understand that, we have to go back to... But they do have a claim to the territories. I understand. In order to understand that, we have to go back to the San Remo um, the conference, the British Mandate for Palestine San Remo Conference of 1920. This is international law, okay? The San Remo Conference was, everybody accepted this as international law. Okay. And the purpose okay, of... Okay, when you say everybody accepted the, it... The country, all the countries of the world at the time accepted this as international law. Okay. And the San Remo Conference said that the British mandate, the British uh, were controlling Palestine at the time, but it was only meant to be a temporary thing until they were ready to leave. And when they're ready to leave, it says, it's going to be responsible for placing the country under political, administrative, and economic conditions to secure the establishment of the Jewish national home, as said in the preamble, and the development of self-governing institutions, right? Um, irrespective, okay. So it is meant to be, the Jewish national home is meant to be in Palestine, in British Mandate Palestine. They, there were no borders of saying whether it's part of it or all of it or anything like that, but it was. it's a general enough statement that the Jewish people feel and I believe with very good reason, that the entire area of British Mandate Palestine is, they have a claim to it, based on international law, based on the San Remo Conference. Okay. Okay? Nobody else is mentioned in the San Remo Conference. It doesn't say, oh, and Palestinians and Arabs are going to have their own homeland or their own state or anything like that. But the fact like that. that you're even calling them Palestinians, they've hijacked Palestinians, just so you know. That's I just want to keep saying this because it's like their marketing is phenomenal. Yes. And they spread the lies, and they've been very successful at it. Yes, and the, I, I don't want it to go off on a tangent, but the reason I say the word Palestinians here is a couple of reasons. One is because if I keep using the accurate language, nobody's going to end up listening because they're going to, again, call me a right-wing fanatic. And two... It sounds like I'm becoming a right-wing right fanatic. <laughs> I'm sorry. And two is because um, I do believe that nowadays, due to the actions of Arabs, there is such a thing as a Palestinian people. Back in 1920, I don't believe there was. Back in 1949, there was. Today, I would believe there actually are a people. That's a whole different story, and I don't want to get off on the tangent right there. For there. I know, but it's still a marketing hijacking. I'm sorry, and so I want to okay. make sure that it's to your listeners that they get it. Okay, okay I've said it enough. Continue. <laughs> okay. So, the, um, so based on that, based on these two facts, that San Remo gave apparently, from the wording, seems to have given only the Jewish people and nobody else the rights to build a homeland in this entire area. That's the Israel's legal argument that it has to 
the entire area, not just the parts that are within the Green Line, but also to the West Bank and Gaza, because they were all part of the British mandate. Um, the Palestinians have no such claim. Of course they don't, but the thing is, is that they also don't follow any rules or regulations either. Okay. There's a, let's, we have to stay on topic because those people are going to lose uh, sight of what's going on over here. I apologize. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> so, but let's say, but let's even pretend that Jordan was the sovereign. Like, according to Great Britain, Jordan did actually own this, which means that if Jordan did own it, since Jordan was a state, then Israel indeed was occupying this land from Jordan. Okay, let's say even okay, let's even you. say that's true. Okay, the um, but not Gaza wouldn't be under that, but this this part would be considered uh, occupied for Jordan. In 1988, Jordan gave up on the West Bank. Jordan said, "You know what? We don't want it. We give up all of our rights to the West Bank." Okay, and how did they do that? They just wrote. They just announced it. That's okay, all it was. Where? Just they just they wrote an announcement. I can show you on the Jordanian. I'm not going to go now, but it's on the Jordanian government website. It might be worth it just for the heck of it. Okay, but they gave up on it. They sort of said, "Oh, you know, we'll we'll let the Palestinians take care of it." But there was no entity called Palestine. There's no legal entity at the time in 1988. You know, it's called Palestine. There were no Palestine. You know, again, from a legal perspective, that was meaningless. Jordan just said, "It's not ours anymore." Then who has the best claim to it now? The only people that have claimed to it at that, at that point, as of 1988, is Israel. The Jewish people, Israel representing the Jewish people, as it said in the San Remo conference. So calling these territories occupied is generally a, an inaccurate statement. Okay. It is, um, the word disputed is far more accurate because Israel does have a claim, has a legal claim to it based on San Remo, and uh, besides I mean, I'm not even getting into the biblical claim. I'm not even getting into the uh, emotional claim. I'm not even getting into any of that stuff of the fact that, you know, the Jews are the indigenous people of the area of Judea and Samaria. So, you know, the Palestinians, you know, Arabs c claim to be indigenous, but the Jews were there first. So I'm not even getting into that stuff. Okay. I'm saying purely from a legal perspective. Now, if, um, if a birthright person would say everything I'm saying right now to a typical college student that's coming on birthright, it would probably still leave a bad taste in the mouth of the college students because they would be saying, okay, disputed, occupied, whatever it is, but Israel's treating the Palestinians terribly and they don't have a right to do that. Okay, let's, uh, let's Again, go with I that. Again, I say it's a marketing thing, but it go is. ahead. Okay, fine, but that's a, that's what, that would be their answer. Now, the fact is, Israel has, even though Israel says it's a disputed territory and they say that they have a claim to at least part of the territory, they also have voluntarily said we will adhere to the Geneva Convention rules, the human, humanitarian rules of the Geneva Convention for how to treat an occupied people because, listen, there are stateless people. There's a few million, you know, Palestinian Arabs. We don't want them to become members of, you know, we don't want to make them citizens of mm -hmm. our thing. We, want, we, we have to come up with a solution. Everybody agrees they have to come up with a solution. Um, but Israel has claimed to some of the land Mm -hmm. Because there's, you know, they want, you know, there are certain whole Jew Jewish holy places. There are places that Jews live there. So the Jews, you know, and, and there are places that Jews lived before the, the 1948 war. So so it's a, it is a complicated thing. You know, if not now hates thing, oh, we, the answer being complicated. Of course the answer is complicated. If you actually look at the facts, it's very complicated. If not now hates that, no, the fact that it's complicated. Because they want to say simple, oh, Israel bad, Palestinians good, blah. That's the way it is. That's garbage. Of That's course ridiculous. it's garbage, but the fact of the matter is, is that you've got to make it at least simple enough so that somebody can actually retribute what they're saying. Yeah, but uh, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. But um, but nevertheless, it is a complicated thing. But to sum up, as we are right now, it is the territories calling the territories occupied is inaccurate. Okay. The um, disputed is a far more accurate way of looking of. I'm talking about the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. So if somebody's there, it's inaccurate. Right. Okay, so and it's actually here. a disputed land. Okay. Right. It's disputed land. Israel has claim has has, has it, the best claim to it when it comes down to it. Okay. It, it, so Israel has the best claim. Absolutely. All right. Now Israel doesn't necessarily want all of it because again Israel doesn't want to control these millions of Arabs okay. and make them citizens because that would destroy the Jewish state. So Israel is in a, uh, in a predicament over here of exactly what to do with these lands. Uh, the, all of the Israeli governments have said that they support a two-state solution for this very reason. They, want, they, they say they want to have a, an Arab state over there so they don't have to worry about controlling all of these Arabs over here. But there are problems with doing that. The main problem is the Israelis have offered peace plans 
And the Arabs have always said no. Okay, no matter how good it is. Right, it doesn't matter. So, so, and, and also I just want to stress over here, the Gaza Strip is not occupied by any possible definition of the term. Okay, fair enough. Um, because so that's number four. Because there's no the Gaza Strip's not occupied it's either. Not occupied because there's no Israeli. There's no soldiers anyway anywhere on in the Gaza Strip. And when we go back to the original definition, no, sorry, go back here. When we go back to Article 42, it says it extends only to territory where such authority can be established. You know, it has been established. It can be exercised. So effectively, um, the only <clears throat> It's not occupation, the way I like to look at it. It's not occupation unless the occupying army can fire the judges or fire the trash people or anything like that. Israel has no authority on Gaza. Israel Whatsoever. can invade Gaza if they wanted to. And the same thing applies to Area A, what's called Area A of the um, under Palestinian authority control. They have their own government. They have their own land because Israel gave land under the Oslo agreements, gave it to them, and so they have all military control. Yes, Israel sometimes Even though invades. they gave land, there's more wars, but go ahead. No, I understand, but, uh, you know, Israel, okay, it's true occasionally, you know, Israel might go into chase after somebody, after a terrorist, but the land is under their control. It's not, you know, even for that reason, again, it cannot be considered occupied territory. There's okay. A, just as yet another reason because occupied territory, the, the, it is the job of the occupier under international law to take over all of the functions of government, meaning trash collection, meaning making sure the mail gets there, making sure they have a court system, making sure that the taxes are paid, making sure that zoning regulation, all of that stuff is there. And if you look at all of the details of, of occupation law, all of that stuff is the, is the responsibility of the occupier. Israel gave certainly area A. Area B, you can argue about because area B is under Israeli military control, even though it's under Palestinian civil control. But Area A, the part like Ramallah and where all of the major, um, where, where most of the Palestinians live, um, are is you know is not under Israeli control at all. So even if you don't accept my argument that occupation has to be between two states, even if you say no, well, occupation law really should apply to any you know state that get or any area of land that gets invaded. And you can make that argument. Some people make that argument. I believe it's a wrong argument if you actually read the law, but people can make that argument. But even if you make that argument, those areas that are under Palestinian authority control are not occupied by definition. There's no possible way they can be occupied. Okay, I get it. So the answer is it's complicated. If you're going back to... But it's, uh, a, it's an emotional occupation. What does it mean? What does emotional no, occupation mean? No, what I'm saying to you is because somebody says something and they believe it without checking into it, they have an emotional occupation. Okay, so it doesn't... Nevertheless, but but even with it... But I'll even go with that argument. The Palestinians would say, hey, it's just what's the matter? Whether What, what does it matter whether we're legally occupied or not? You know, we're not in control of all of our lives. We're not to... And, and I'm sympathetic to the argument. It's not like I'm going to throw out the argument. I'm not trying to use legalisms to throw out the argument. And this is what the birthright people should answer as well when they're asked this question. The, the answer is, and this is fundamental to understand, Israel doesn't want to control these guys. Israel would love to have a peaceful Palestinian state on parts of these lands. Okay. Okay. Israel wants part of it, absolutely, but they would love to have a peaceful Palestinian state on part of these lands. That is not happening. It is not possible right now because of how the Palestinians have acted. And I will tell you something else. Okay. Let's go back over here. Let's go back to question number three. What is the impact of the occupation on Palestinian and Israeli lives? Let's talk about that for a little bit. I'm surprised that they actually put and Israeli lives. I know, because they're trying to say that the occupation is hurting Israelis, which in a way, it, you, you could, it's not occupation, but in a way you could say that you know, Israel having being next to these people and having control, military control over part of the, of the area does impact Israeli lives. Sure it does, because uh, you know, their, their sons and, and daughters and, and you know, brothers are actually having to go there and man checkpoints and do all these things that nobody really wants to do. But let's talk about that. Okay, let's do Right them. now, Palestinian lives, you're right. When Palestinians want to go from one area of, of, the, of Judea and Samaria or from the West Bank to another area, very often they have to go through checkpoints. Mm -hmm. Very often, if they want to go into Israel, they have to go through more checkpoints, just like if you have to go to any country. It's, it's, it's no worse than going through an airport, 
but they make a big deal over it. Okay, checkpoints, 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 and I'm sure it's a pain. You know, people want to just have their lives, they want to go to work, and it's a pain. I'm sure it's a pain. Now, let's go back to before there was a Palestinian Authority, before the Oslo process, okay? Okay. If there was any time you could say there was an occupation, even though I don't, I disagree with the word, but it would be before all that time, before the Palestinian Authority existed. Okay. okay? So they, and so there were there were Jews living, and still are obviously, but Jews living in the West Bank and in Gaza, and the Palestinian Arabs were living there as well. Let's say a Palestinian Arab wanted to go anywhere. They got in the car and went somewhere. There were no checkpoints. Okay. They could go to Israel if they wanted to. No problem. It was no big deal. Okay. Israelis would go shopping in Arab towns. Arabs would go shopping in Israeli towns. Okay. We've talked to people when we were in Israel. We talked to people that described this, you know, that uh, literally the, 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 we spoke to people who would go to Ramallah to buy challah for Shabbat because the Angel Bakery opened up, you know, sold the challahs to a bakery in Ramallah so that the Jews that lived there could actually go get it. Jews could visit their friends, you know, Arab friends. Arabs could visit their Jewish. There was essentially no border, you know. People from Gaza could go to the West Bank. This is the way it was before 1988, okay? okay? This is, you know, everybody nowadays is saying, oh, things are so terrible, so terrible, so terrible. Things were okay over then, okay? There was no, there was peace by any definition. You know, there was coexistence, occasional attack, really very few, a few terror attacks in those days. Okay. In 1988, I believe the year was, began the first intifada. Okay. And then the Palestinian Arabs decided, oh, we're going to start uprising against the, uh, the Jews. And then they started, you know, essentially throwing stones, shootings, all these sort of things. Um, several hundred were killed. Okay. In, I mean, both sides. Several hundred were killed. Um, they call it a nonviolent uprising, but it was quite violent. Israel, naturally, had to defend itself. Okay. Um, and it started putting in rules of what to do, you know, in order to defend itself from these, you know, this new th- situation. Then came Oslo, and everybody got optimistic again. 1993, oh, there's going to be peace. Everything's wonderful. And they, um, and they were negotiating, and Israel gave land up, gave land to the, to the Palestinians, mm-hmm. and, you know, the Palestinian Authority was set up, and they had their own, you know, the PLO was essentially, you know, had their own little statelet, which effectively it is, because their own government, their own areas that they controlled, and things seemed to be looking okay. Then came Camp David, and um, you know, and then the you know the, the the Clinton parameters. There were you know a couple of offers of peace in two thousand and two thousand one, and the Palestinians said no way. Yep. Also, they started doing the, the terror attacks didn't start in two thousand one. The terror attacks started during the Oslo process. The first suicide bombs you know were from from Hamas and everything like that happened in the nineties. It did not happen then, but nevertheless. So after. Arafat said no to the Israeli offer. And this is, again, Clinton worked on this. This is, this is again, you know, the, uh, you know, the hero of the progressive left nowadays, Bill Clinton, was uh, worked very hard in order to find something, a plan that would be acceptable to the Palestinians as well as to Israel. And, you know, the first plan was they, the Palestinians rejected, and he gave them more. You know, mm-hmm. he worked on it harder. He gave them more stuff. And, and the Israel still said, okay, because we want peace so badly, we're going to do this. And the Palestinians said, no way, we're not going to do this. This is an insult. Yasser Arafat said there's no way because he knew if he accepts peace, then, you know, the Arab world and his own people are going to say, no, we really want all of Israel. We do, we're not accepting the end of the conflict. Right. Understood. They and want the whole thing. They want the whole thing. And immediately afterwards started the Second Intifada, the huge wave of suicide bombings and bus bombings and all of the other stuff that killed well over a thousand Jews, and in the end, thousands of Palestinian Arabs. What does Israel do? It has to defend itself. So it starts putting in rules. Okay, you can't come to Israel as easily as you could before. You have to get permits. It started building a defensive barrier to stop the suicide bombers, and it worked because the number of suicide bombings went down precipitously after Israel built this. So when If Not Now is saying, you know, what's the impact of the occupation? It's not the impact of the occupation. If even if you call it occupation beforehand, even if you even if, if we admit that, and we and I'm not, but even if you call it Israel occupied or Israel controlled that land since 1967, they were walking. There were there was ease, you know. They, everybody was fine, you know. There was I mean there was a little bit of unease in the very beginning, but there was freedom of movement, mm-hmm. you know, in, between 1967 and 1988 or whatever. 
Okay. And the only problems now isn't a problem of the so-called occupation. It's because of Palestinian terror. It is because the Palestinians decided we would rather kill Jews than make peace with them. Well, because they want the whole land of Israel. They do. And all polls have said that. In other words, even the Palestinians, only a couple of times do the pollsters ask this question. They'll say, you know, sometimes they'll ask, would you prefer a one, you know, do you prefer to have a two-state solution or do you prefer to fight? A lot of people will say two-state solution. Then only a couple of times have pollsters actually had the guts to ask the next question. Do you look at the two-state solution as an end in itself or do you look at it as a stepping stone in order to take over all of Israel? And the majority say, this is both the, uh, the, the Israel Project had a poll like this. I can't remember the name of the second one that had the poll. But, um, but they, they two both asked the same question, and the Palestinian Arabs answered, we want it to be a stepping stone. You know, majority say, we want a stepping stone in order for us to control all of the land. Mm-hmm. Israel has to defend itself, okay? Let's talk about human rights, because, again, this is the sort of thing that If Nots Now is going to say, oh, Palestinian human rights are, are in danger. Israel is trampling on their human rights. Here's the fundamental thing, and, again, this is the sort of thing birthright does not equip its people to talk about. But this is what the point is over here. Israelis have human rights too. The human right not to be blown up by a bomb is a bigger human right than the Palestinian human right not to sit at a checkpoint. Nobody wants that they should be sticking sitting at checkpoints. Nobody wanted to build these walls. Nobody wanted to do any of that stuff. They had to in order to protect lives. This is the important fact. Israelis have human rights as well. Israeli Jews have the right to live. And if Israel has to enforce that human right in order to make things less convenient for Palestinians, that's the line they have to draw. In other words, Israel, it's not a a good guys and bad guys type thing. And the the idiots at If Not Now are pretending this is a good guy against bad guy thing. They're the ones that are pretending it's simplistic. It's garbage. It's not a simplistic thing. Here's the issue, and here's the fundamental issue of it. Israel wants to give Arabs that are under their control all of the human rights they possibly can give them up into the line of where they're going to be able to kill Jews. They can't give them all the rights because when they gave them all the rights, they took advantage of that and started suicide bombing and started bombing buses and started doing all the other sort of things that they were doing. That is the issue. Israel has to protect its own citizens. Every nation on the planet has the, the first obligation of any nation on the planet is to protect its own citizens. Israel is no different than that. To protect its own citizens, it has to put restrictions, unfortunately, on the Palestinian Arabs. Nobody wants to do that. The problem is the Palestinian Arabs have shown no indication of really wanting true peace with Israel. Their maps don't have anything about Israel. All of their maps show all of Israel and is one big Palestine. They don't teach their children. Oslo was in 1993, okay? This was, what, 25 years ago. And... It was, even in those 25 years, an entire Palestinian generation grew up. None of them were taught, oh, you're going to supposed to live in peace with the Jews. The school books don't say it. The radio stations don't say it. The TV shows don't say it. They had 25 years in order to teach peace. They taught war. Instead, they're teaching martyrdom is what they're supposed to do. I'm not saying every Palestinian is evil. I'm not saying every Palestinian is a terrorist. But what I am saying is that the entire culture, and I'm not exaggerating about this, the entire Palestinian Arab culture is one that glorifies martyrdom. It glorifies killing Israeli Jews. The people that are the biggest terrorists are the biggest heroes. That is the problem. That's what Israel is up against. Israel has to protect its citizens. Nobody wants to inconvenience them. Everybody wants human rights for everybody. That's not an issue. Of course, Palestinians should have human rights, but Israelis deserve human rights too. And if Israel wasn't protecting their own selves, the Palestinians would be killing all the Israelis at random as much as they want. We could talk about a lot of other stuff about Israel when it goes to war, everything it does in order to try to minimize the civilian casualties. That's a whole other issue. That's, you know, that's five other shows if we wanted to get into it. But the fundamental fact is, if you believe that Israel is evil, if you believe that Israel is trying to just hurt Palestinians and wants genocide and all this other garbage, you're not a serious person. Israelis are human beings. They want to do what's best. They want to do what's moral. They want to do what's best for everybody. And if you're only looking at one side of the story, the way these idiots at If Not Now are, thinking, oh, only the Palestinians have rights, only the Palestinians are put upon, no, they're not. Israel is surrounded by countries that hate it, by hundreds of millions of Arabs who would like to destroy it, although that is changing due to some brilliance of of Israeli diplomacy. That is changing in some of the Arab countries. Sounds good to me. the fact is, 
it is complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because the Palestinian Arabs have had close to three decades in order to teach their children peace, and they chose instead to teach, to be to, to love to terrorists, hatred. hatred, and that's the problem. And until that changes, which is not going to happen anytime soon, until that changes, then we're stuck with the situation we're in right now, which is the best possible situation as much as it stinks. It's the best we can do because things were worse before. There were bus bombings. That is not acceptable. If, if not now, wants to get, get rid of the wall and they'd rather have bus bombings, then they're the most immoral people on the planet. And they're pretending to be moral. It's garbage. They are immoral because they don't give a damn about Israeli lives. They pretend to. They say, oh, if the Palestinians would get what they want, then Israel would be, Israel would be safer. That is garbage because the Palestinians did have what they wanted. They were at peace. They were able to move. They were able to do whatever they want. And they decided to bomb Israel. They decided to blow things up. And they decided to make heroes into the people that do it. And they still are heroes today. And they've spread terrorism throughout the world. They did that too, although they made a they made a decision to keep it local, you know, after the 70s. But nevertheless, this is what the truth is. This is what Israel has to look. So when when if not now says we want the truth, this is what the truth is, and this is what the people from birthright should be telling them. And they should stand up and say this stuff proudly. They I don't think that they learn this stuff. Again, they're tour guides. They're not meant to talk about this sort of thing. But you know, if not now says, oh, the tour guides say that all the Palestinians are bad. No, not all the Palestinians are bad. But here's what really happens: you will be hard pressed to find a Palestinian newspaper that that denounces terror against Israeli Jews in unambiguous terms. When there's a terror attack, they cheer. And the more specific the terror attack, the more the polls support support it. When there was the attack that killed five rabbis in Jerusalem, on the inside the Green Line, there was like 80% approval rating among the Palestinians. Don't tell me that this is Israel's fault, that the Palestinians are applauding the killing and the, the, the slaughter, literally the slaughter with, with uh, machetes of, of five rabbis. Don't tell me that, but they did cheer it. And it's an ugly fact that nobody wants to look at, but it is true. Palestinian, you would not be able to find a Palestinian newspaper that said, oh, this is terrible, we're against it. No, as a matter of fact, they cheered on and they say, do more, do more, do more. It's okay to kill. Exactly. And kill as many Jews, and it's right. sad, and it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So even Abbas won't say it directly because he knows the West is listening to what he's saying, but he still calls them heroes. He still calls the people that did it heroes. He still pays them, and there are salaries that are paid to all of the, you know, the ones that are in prison and for the relatives of those that killed themselves trying to kill Jews. Those, they get paid. This is ridiculous. It's disgusting, and that is the immorality that, if not now, should be going after if they really cared about morality. But they don't. Well, what can the readers do? I mean, the readers, excuse yeah, me, <laughs> listeners. I'm sorry. What can listeners do? The, um, I mean, again, they just, uh, all you can do spread is the understand the facts, spread the word, spread this video, um, go, you know, and, and, and confront them. Once you know the facts, you can actually go up to If Not Now and tell them and ask them if they want to ask questions, you can ask them questions. You can ask them, hey, exactly, do you consider all of the all of Israel occupied? Do you think that you believe in the, that there should be a Jewish state? Do you believe that Jews have the right to self-determination? You should be asking them these questions because then you're going to find out what disgusting lowlifes these people are, that they, can tr they pretend to be moral, and they pretend that they're all only innocently asking questions, but the fact is they're not listening to any answers, and all of the stuff they're doing is dedicated to destroy Israel as a Jewish state. And I'm sorry, that is immoral. That is ridiculous, and that is a violation of human rights. So don't tell me about human rights. Israelis have human rights. Palestinians do too. I'm not saying they don't. But I'm saying you have to walk a line in order to be able to balance the two human rights against each other. And that's exactly what Israel is doing. Sometimes it ends up on one side. Sometimes it ends up on the other side. Sometimes Israel sacrifices soldiers for, for reasons just for like PR because they don't want to make it look like, oh, we're killing Palestinians, and it's ridiculous. That's not a, that's that doesn't help human rights. That's not moral either. But sometimes it goes the other way, in which you know that uh, that they sometimes they'll be they make mistakes, and sometimes there's a battle or something like that, in which uh, civilians get killed. Nobody wants that to happen. Israel wants that to happen less I know, than anybody. I even speaking about civilians, it's very minimal, meaning they, that they, it's they, not something that they try to do precision um, um, work over there. And the fact of the matter is, is that when something like that happens, it's part of war. You know? It is, and, and Israel like does a far better job the, exactly. than, any, than any nation in history in war as far as minimizing. So, again, that's a whole other topic, and I don't I'm not disagreeing that. with you, but so for now, if not now, has it wrong? Yeah, if not now, has it very wrong. And it's also very interesting, Just I just want to bring this up as, as we end, because this ended up being much longer than I expected. Hey, but, you're animated and, and passionate about yeah. it, so bring it on. <laughs> okay, but when they talk about Rabbi Hillel, and again, he's not Rabbi Hillel, but Hillel, 
Um, if you look at Hillel's life, um, Hillel was born in, in Babylon. Okay. And when he was 40 years old, guess where he moved? <gasps> Tell me. <laughs> he moved to Israel. <gasps> he he did. moved to Jerusalem. He was a Zionist. So if not now is uh, is you know has a settler on their on their page over there you know a uh, a Babylonian settler. Obviously <laughs> somebody's very skewed who's running that organization <laughs> right. because they don't have the facts. Bring on your facts and uh, write Elder of Zion so that you can actually find out the real answers. What do you say by that? Exactly. So. It, and at any rate, since we are at over 40 minutes right now, I'm going to be signing things off right now. So for now, I'm Elder. And I'm Mrs. Elder. And before I sign off, don't forget to support us. Go ahead, and if you want to um, send us any donations so we can keep doing this, we'd really appreciate it. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds great to me, but the fact of the matter is we need to spread the word. We need your help. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time.